Hello and welcome and today I'm very pleased that we're actually going to be talking to about something that's actually very close to Talk Health, my heart and actually to the Talk Health community which is to discuss what is research and what do we mean about clinical research, what does it mean about getting involved, what will be expected of you and um at Talk Health, as you know, we run both anecdotal trials and we support institutions such as universities and the NAHR in um, clinical recruitment. And today I'm very pleased that we have with us from the NIHR Liverpool Clinical Research Facility, Dr. Richard um, Fitzgerald and Kate Dodd. Now, Richard is the director and is a consultant physician in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. And Kate is the recruitment and engagement manager. So welcome, both of you. Thank you. Morning. So it's really interesting because I think, you know, we all hear about clinical research and we can, you know, and we all have our own ideas what it is. But what what really is it? And that's what I'm very keen to, to get to. But Richard, first of all, would you like to just say who the NIHR is? Um, because I think lots of people may have heard about them. And, and, you know, just very quickly, it is the nation's largest funder of health and social care research. But other than that, what is it? Yeah, so um, the NIHR is um, effectively the research arm of the NHS. So it all sits as part of the Department of Health and Social Care. And NIHR funds research um, across the uh, across England, uh, focused on um, clinical trials, other types of research, um, and social care research. So it's really fundamental to uh, us being able to take great ideas from universities, from the NHS, from um, the sort of commercial sectors, and drive that innovation, often driven through NHS and social care. Um, but it makes sure that the great ideas don't get lost, they get funded, and then they get tested, and then we see whether we can get them into practice. Covers everything from the very early stuff, sort of in laboratories, through to sort of very large scale clinical trials running across the entirety of the NHS or social care. So if we start off with clinical trials, it's absolutely not, oh, here's a medicine, let's go and find people to test it doesn't work like that. It's years in the making. So I think it'd be helpful if you could explain to us what those stages are. Sure. So you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, just to get a medicine into a, a new medicine into a human being for the very first time takes decades of work beforehand. So this is all about looking to make sure you know anything that that is you know tested in a clinical trial um is safe and has the potential to be an effective treatment and we do that through lots of ways to do lots of laboratory testing we do testing in in you know uh in test tubes in dishes and in in small numbers of occasions in animals before it goes into human uh, testing and that takes around about five to ten years for each medicine and then once it's into human beings, we'll, we'll start with very small trials uh, where we start at really, 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 really low doses, slowly build those doses up to where we think that dose will be, that, that will be an effective medicine. And then we'll take it out into increasingly bigger trials so that we can then, instead of focusing very much on the safety and, and what the medicine does in the body, we'll then focus on, is it an effective medicine? Where does it fit into in terms of treatment? Do we need to compare it against an existing treatment to see whether it's the same, better, worse, et cetera? And then at that point, once we have the data on the safety, what the drug does to the body and uh, whether the drug is effective, then it has to go through another process where it goes uh, to be licensed. And, and that's part of what the medicines and healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRA in the UK, but people may have heard of the FDA in the USA and the European Medicines Agency, and they pour all uh, over the data, a truckload of data. In fact, in the old days, it was a truck. Nowadays, electronically, and they will go through every piece of information and decide whether there are sufficient data to say 
this is an effective medicine, it's a safe medicine, and it should be given uh, as a treatment to patients uh, around the world. And I think maybe at this point, it's, I was going to say, why is, why are trials, well, obviously why trials are very important, but why is it important that we educate people about trials? So, uh, you know, fundamentally, you know, trials and research are so important because we, we we make progress that way. There really isn't another way of making progress in terms of developing new treatments, new techniques, new ways of dealing with diseases. Um, we have to have research as part of that because we have to know whether what we're doing is right, whether it is the safe thing to do, whether it's the effective things to do. You know, so so, so absolutely fundamental parts of what we do. It, it, it's a core question. We. When we're doctors, nurses, you know, anybody else in the, in the health service in the university, we are, you know, treating patients all the time, but will often be questions. Can we do that better? Is there a way of doing that better? And that's, you know, the genesis of research. So really, really important. But there's a lot of mystique about research and trials. And, you know, so it, it all seems a bit mysterious, a little bit opaque, because people may not come into contact with it all the time. We want people to come into it all the time, and increasingly, for example, NIHR are really pushing that through. It should, you know, every patient in every encounter should have the opportunity to consider research as part of their clinical care. So what we need to do as researchers is to say, hello, we're here. Um, it isn't mysterious. I'm not a magician. I'm not a wizard. I wish I was, <laughs> um, but sadly not. That's more of a you know, Harry Potter fantasy thing, I think. Um, but, you know, we're, we're here. Nothing is mysterious. And if you are interested in research, come and talk to us. Um, you know, have a conversation. Having a conversation about research does not mean that we immediately get you to sign on the dotted line uh, to say, oh, I want to take part in research. We're more than happy just to have a chat about what it is, what we do, why we do it, how we do it, what would happen if you wanted to get involved. Um, and And that's a bit the serious ivory tower of great academic achievement or commercial, you know, sort of thing. We want it to be something that is accessible, something that people see and consider it as part of something that would be a routine healthcare encounter. Now, obviously, every trial is different and the recruitment criteria um, is different. Um and I know that, you know, criteria can be very strict and you kind of think, oh, my God, does it really matter that I'm a different age group to what they're recruiting? And clearly it does because our body functions differently on our, on our age. But if we were going in um, for recruitment, what sort of things, and then maybe, Kate, as you deal with, actually deal with the patients, what sort of things do patients, I was going to say have to face, and I don't mean have to face, but what is it that they can expect? So for us as a clinical research facility, when somebody approaches us with an expression of interest to take part in a trial, they're provided with the information leaflet first before we have any conversations. They get time, as much time as they want, whether it's 24 hours or two weeks, to review that information discuss it with friends, family, their doctor. And then when they're ready, they come back to us. And we have a dedicated team here who will speak to them, address any questions they may have. And those questions we may not be able to answer, but we have physicians and we have nurses who will be able to answer all of those questions. And we can bring people in for chats just to discuss the trial and their concerns. If they are interested, we can then run through some very basic questions. And those questions are individual to each trial. So depending on what the trial is, it will look at what the age is, um, potentially their height and weight, if they have any particular medical conditions, if they're taking any medication, we might ask about their smoking history. Um, it all depends on that trial. And then we get a very basic overview as to whether they will be eligible to come in for a screening appointment. That screening appointment is then booked and that's when they come in. They discuss the study in further detail with um, a doctor. And then that's the point that they make a decision as to whether they want to take part or not. 
if they're not ready and they want more time, then that's absolutely fine. They can go away without signing the consent form and we can bring them back in at another point. We will work with you know, our participants. We aren't pressuring anybody to take part. It's completely you know, everybody's decision, individual decision. Mm -hmm. We will not influence that in any way. If they want more time, great. If they want to sign up, great. We will, as I said, work with them. You said um, that you know each trial is very different, and sometimes it might not be our team who approaches the patient. You know, if it's somebody with a particular condition, it might actually be their doctor who approaches them to discuss the trial in the first place, and they will have very different conversations because the doctor will have access to their medical records and be able to do a more in-depth review of whether they will be eligible for that particular trial. I don't know if you want to add anything at that point. No, I, I think just to say, you know, complete agreement. The, the the whole point about it is it moves at the pace of uh, whatever a potential research participant wants it to be. So there isn't pressure applied at any point in all of this. And, and obviously there are some eligibility criteria that apply to all, you know, sort of trials that we do. Um, and that's important for several reasons. You know, it, it sort of, you know, makes sure that, when we're sort of testing a, a new medicine or a new technique or a new device, that we have a fairly uniform population, you know, that we can then draw conclusions about effectiveness. So if it looks like it's more effective, you know, in patients that have the, the, the new intervention, the drug, the device or whatever, then we need to be able to say, well, actually, it's most likely down to the drug or device or whatever, rather than the fact that they're, you know, sort of, 18 climbing mountains and therefore you know very very fit as opposed to me as a you know 40 something you know uh, increasingly middle-aged fella who's, who's who's slowly getting slower um you know so, so we need to have that uniform um group of of individuals however and i would draw a line under that to say that that perhaps for too long we've concentrated on the ideal you know uh, adonis type specimen particularly for healthy participant trials, but the same is true for patients. We try and go for the most healthy of the patient groups. But actually that doesn't represent the typical person who's taking the medicine at the end of this. And actually it's really important that we know whether drugs are effective in those patients uh, that have lots of other medical conditions or maybe taking lots of other medicines for, for lots of other medical conditions um, and at the right ages. So what we're seeing now is we're developing what, what, what we term more pragmatic clinical trials. So, so more representative of the people we try to serve with the research. So if it is designed for people who are older, uh, for people that may be taking lots of medicines, then we need to include those patients. So I think what people will see over the next sort of five and 10 years is that increasingly the trials have become less strict about who they take. We'll always make sure that it's very safe number one, that's our absolute priority at all times, safety. So we'll make sure that people are safe, but we'll widen the criteria to try and make sure that we have representative patients. And now for even very early clinical trials, so you think of some of our trials at the moment, Kate, you know, we, we, we may do some testing in healthy participants, first of all, and then we'll move into the patient groups really quickly, because actually we need to know very early on that it's going to work for a patient, it's going to not cause you know, side effects for patients. We need to take uh, to to check that right at the beginning, rather than waiting for you know uh, ten years down the line of drug development before we discover that it actually doesn't work at all in patient groups. It's funny, isn't it? Because it does sound like isn't that the the obvious to take those people? And I mean, there's there's more now in the press of the fact that it's always been you know everything was always tested on the average male. They never took into account it was Absolutely. a woman or a woman going through the menopause or what, whatever it is. And um, the other thing that I was sort of going to say is, do people come to trials because they're, they're hoping for a miracle? Are they expecting to get cured? Now, we all know generally that we don't like the word, especially because at Talk Health we deal specifically with chronic conditions. And actually, I'm very pleased to say that since... Um, I've been working with Talk Health. There actually have been a number of cures for chronic conditions, but still we don't like that word because I think that's a very frightening and misleading term. But do you find many people come on to your trials 
for looking for that miracle cure. Um, so I'll take your thoughts in a yeah. minute, Kate, because obviously you're right at the front end of this in terms of patients coming mm -hmm. in and chatting, having those very initial conversations. So, so we, um, I, I, I always give a, um, a, a, a little bit of a story here because I think it illustrates it perfectly. So the answer is some people may turn up and, and think, well, is this going to be a miracle cure? And, you know, this is where talking about research is really important because we can explain the context. And we can explain generally in clinical trials that we are looking to see whether things are effective. We don't know whether there'll be a cure. You know, we're all hoping for the next big thing for a range of different diseases that we would like to treat much better than we currently do. Uh, but the talk of a cure, I quite agree, is, is, is quite an emotive one. It's quite a, it's, you know, it's a, it, it's a big thing, isn't it? And actually that does happen, as you say. But in the clinical trial space, we are looking at stuff where we're assessing whether it's effective. And our job as researchers is to tell people that and, and talk to people about why we do it. We're wanting that cure, but we can't tell them, you know, that this trial is going to benefit them, you know, in, to any great extent, because that's what we're kind of trying to assess. We're trying to assess whether stuff is effective or not. A great example was, uh, you know, so, so again, a condition we'd all love to have a, a magic <laughs> wand to get rid of, of course, is Alzheimer's dementia. And so we do quite a lot of Alzheimer's dementia work in, in this unit and I always tend to have a, a couple of trials ongoing. And we were we were assessing a, a particular uh, vaccine for, for, for Alzheimer's disease designed to help clear some of the protein out of the brain that, that can make Alzheimer's disease worse. And, you know, we had a patient who who developed a condition that's very common as you get older, something called polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, um, but of course, if you develop conditions like polymyalgia, which is where the immune system goes a bit crazy, we had to stop the study drug uh, because um, it was an injection and could make, you know, immune reactions even more sort of, uh, you know, fulsome. So the protocol, the study protocol, which is our Bible, when you're on the study, tells us what we can do and what we can't do. And so it says you can't continue. And so we went to speak to the patient, and there were, were two options for the patients and their carer. One was you left the trial uh, as we were halfway through the trial. Uh, you would get fully compensated for everything that, that was yet to come in the trial because it wasn't your fault you were coming off the trial. Or you could continue the trial, never receive another injection, but still have to have some of the scans and things that we were doing to assess the effectiveness. And so I went in there as quite a young researcher at the time and fully expecting the, the patients and their carer to turn around to me and say, yeah, it's been a pleasure, lovely, but thank you very much. That's our lot now. And the patient and their carer were very clear with me and said, Dr. Fitzgerald, um, I can't believe you're suggesting that we're coming off the trial now. We knew that this trial may not have any benefit for us. We have done it for our kids, our grandkids, because even if the trial isn't successful, we know it will give more information about this dreadful disease. And that's why we did the trial, not because we expected to be cured, but because we wanted to add to the body of knowledge. And I thought, wow, there we go. So, you know, people, you know, have a lot more understanding of what we're asking them to do than sometimes we give them credit for. Uh, and, and that always, always has stuck with me as a young researcher all the way through. Uh, to, to, to now as a you know middle-aged yeah. researcher. Uh, Kay, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I think you, you've spot on. We have a lot of patient you know participants living with conditions, various conditions such as Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, you know asthma, COPD, who know that potentially you know there's nothing that can stop the disease in them, but there might be something that will stop stop it for future generations because these are the people who are living with those conditions at the moment and they will do anything they can to stop their families stop their friends stop future generations having to go through what they're going through and for our patient group yes I agree you know they're doing it for the greater good they're not doing it for what they see as a cure mm. for them they they are very much aware that particularly for our studies that are early on that it is just about the safety and the dose mm. levels for those particular drugs. Um, I mean, we do have some oncology studies, I'd say were slightly different. Yes. You know, they'd be participants who are potentially, there's no treatment options left. 
And I think how they see clinical trials are very different. Yes. But I would say, you know, overall, it's about the greater good yeah. and moving on with treatments and, and, and quality of life. And just a final point, I think, which is really important to emphasize is that even negative data, so, yeah. uh, 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 you know, th there is no effect from a new treatment or technique is still incredibly valuable data because it tells us something about you don't want to be barking up that tree anymore. So, they, so, so even if stuff doesn't work out, it is so important Absolutely. to get that information. And I think that I found that people are incredibly generous with their time when they get and understand what research is. And I, I think what's important is that we you've expressed the difference between general research and oncology research, because we all hear there's a drug that's a clinical trial, it's sort of last resort. And I think lots of people see clinical trials as being that, as opposed to the day-to-day -day standard development of how new drugs get onto the market. I think it's important to make that distinction as well. One of the things that you uh, mentioned, Richard, was, um, oh gosh, I can't think what the word is, is, you know, um, reimbursement. Actually, that's probably a clinical term more than anything, is do, you know, do people get paid to go on research, do you find? So, uh, again, it depends on the type of trial, uh, exactly how, you know, people get paid. Um, you know, and, and the first thing to say is that, that we don't want people to be out of pocket for taking part in research, uh, because obviously this is an extra. So most trials will, you know, pay for the sort of travel expenses, etc., in order to get to clinical trial sites. Now, clearly, th there are some types of research, for example, where people may have to um, spend time in a research unit like ours. So they may spend, you know, a couple of nights, sometimes, you know, for, for the very most intense trials, that may be, you know, a few days, a week or so, where they, they, they would be in the research unit. And in which case, then, we would also pay for time and inconvenience. So the fact is that people have lost time to being in um, uh, the unit um, and they're inconvenienced because they are here. And traditionally, that was always a preserve of healthy participants taking part in research and commercial trials units. One of the big pieces of work that we've done, along with other non-commercial NHS units like ours, and Kate has been particularly vocal about this, and rightly so, is that you know for patients taking part in research when they have to come in overnight, it's exactly the same. They have their time and inconvenience as much as anyone else does. And so they will be paid in addition to their travel expenses, um, um, you know, a, a payment for time and inconvenience spent. And all of that's very standard. It's all guided by um, the uh, Health Research Authority in the UK, uh, which sort of set the ethical standards for research in the UK to make sure that, that it is purely a payment for time and inconvenience and isn't an inducement uh, to take part. So what we what we always say to participants is, is that, that, you know, we will make sure you're not out of pocket for taking part. And in some studies, as will be very clear from the study information, there may be additional payments if you're having to be in the hospital for it, etc. Yeah, I just add to that, that we're very aware <laughs> that, especially in this day and age, that people can't always afford the travel in the first place to come into a trial. So as a unit, we will pay up front for taxis mm. and things. I think that's very important that we don't want to exclude people because that's a very good point. Particularly for us um, in a city, you know, our community are miles and miles. We've got a very large area and we want to make sure that people are able to get to us. You know, parking's a bit of a nightmare. So we will do whatever we can. And I think, you know, other units across the, the country will be the same. We don't want people being out of pocket. And although we reimburse on the day, we're very aware that people might not have that money up front. So we will cover the cost of the taxi and book it for them. So it's just to, to make sure that people, you know, aren't thinking, well, I won't get that, you know, until after the trial finishes, we will do what we can to support people coming in. Yeah, I mean, I've always found that when we're discussing trials with people that I make it very clear up front what is available. And the fact is, I wouldn't want anyone to be out of pocket at yeah. all out of anything that, that, that we do. One of the other things that I think is important to mention is what happens you're halfway through a trial as a patient and you say, oh, just don't fancy this anymore. What, what do you do to those people? 
<laughs> um, so um, the important thing with all clinical trials is that you're in charge. If you are the patient or the participant, you're in charge. So if at a time you you, you feel like, actually, I, th this is too much of a burden for me, um, I'm worried about something or something else is going on in my life, um, you know, then any participant is free to withdraw at any time as part of a, a of a clinical trial we'll you know generally try and work find ways to make it work if it's something to do with for example as kate has described travel or or stuff like that or being flexible with study dates but if a, if anyone wants to leave a trial at any time there is no strings attached um clearly if the you've had a new medicine or something like that We'll always do our best to stay in contact with you, you know, until the trial ends, even if that's just the odd phone call. But even then, if people don't, don't you know, feel that they don't want to do that, then they have the absolute right to do that. And they can. I think that's really important to stress is the fact is that there is no obligation on this. You know, we're all everyone's there. You're volunteering for exactly. it. And which means that you can leave at any any point. And I think I think for research, because we know how important it is to get people into research and how hard it is, is to which is why we're doing this conversation, is to try to lessen the barriers or maybe misconceptions that people help have. Or as you said, Richard, you know, people it is all a bit mystical. You know, you might see this sort of these buildings and say, Well, it's a research building, but oh my god, what on earth goes on behind those walls? And I think it's I mean, perhaps that just leads us on you know, neatly at the end is to actually talk about your facility and what it's like if someone were to come in and stay at your facility. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll start off and then, yeah. Kate, I think you can give the real sort of perspective of the of the, uh, of our participants. Um, so, is so it a five-star hotel? Um, no, I, it's Quite. <laughs> bells and whistles, caviar on tap. <laughs> yeah, just for clarity, there is no caviar. Um, I wish there was, but it's not. It's the NHS. Um, so, so we're a purpose-built unit within the new Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, so we've been open now a year. We're, our old unit has been in existence for 10, 15 years uh, in the old building, which is slowly being demolished behind us. So the, this new unit is purpose designed for research. Um, and so uh, we're in the main hospital as well. So that's really important. So it's easy to find, but also means that, that we have all of our sort of hospital services around us uh, if we ever needed them. So if we sometimes do that for, for certain trials if we need special techniques and things. Um, we're all individual single, single rooms um, with uh, TVs and ensuite bathrooms. And we, we really focused on this in the unit because we knew that that's what participants wanted. You know, it, it's, you know, we gone are the days when people are happy to be on open wards, rightly so, much more about people's privacy, their dignity, et cetera. Um, and so having nice spaces you can call your own, particularly if you're in for a few days with a proper TV that you can hook up Netflix to. Um, there's lots of space. There's a, we're actually sat in our sort of games room at the moment in our lounge. Uh, so nice pictures on the wall you can see of North Wales, uh, but other bits uh, around uh, nice food. But most importantly, and then all of this is our staff. And we have some incredible staff, you know, from our, you know, sort of nurses, our research assistants and support officers, uh, our physicians, even if I do say so myself. Um, but also really importantly, and I think often unrecognised in the work that the, the non-clinical teams do, so the people who aren't in the uniforms, uh, so people like Kate, who runs the you know, recruitment and engagement team, the people who keep the research on the road, the project managers, et cetera, that keep everything moving and, and going swiftly. But it is a lovely new facility. It's purpose-built. Uh, it, it's not quite looks like a hotel, but it's as close to uh, a hotel as you will get within an NHS hospital. Okay, I don't know, because we've got some really lovely participant feedback, yeah. haven't we? So we've done a lot of work since we used moved into the new units. You know, Richard said that we've had this, you know, big new sitting room that we're in. And we've spent a lot of time working out what we need. But it's not about what we need. It's about what the participants need. Um, you know, they spend all day in their rooms potentially and we want to give them somewhere that they can go out a different room so they're not looking at you know the same tv the same four walls <laughs> you know if they're in for a couple of nights um so we've developed this room it's a shame I can't show you but you know we've spoken to our patient public involvement group that we have so these are people who have either been involved in research or 
you know, haven't been involved in research, but have a passion to make sure that research is done. Um, and they've told us what they want. So this room has been designed by them and for them. So we have, you know, some mood lighting. We've got some plants, albeit fake because we're not allowed real plants, some lovely artwork. We've got a PlayStation, you know, for the for the students who are in for healthy volunteer studies. We've got a TV, we've got books, we've got games, we've got colouring. So it, it's a it's a space for them to come and get away from their room. It's a bit less clinical, mm. but nonetheless, it's safe. You know, we've got viewing windows so we can see our participants and there's call bell. So it's still a medical facility, but it's a bit more friendly and a bit mm. more comfortable. And then just to say very briefly that the we obviously have, you know, participants have taken part in trials in the old unit and the new unit now. Uh, and the the feedback on the new unit, yeah. they they quite like the old unit, um, <laughs> but the new unit um, has had tremendous feedback, which is is great. Yeah. But you know, facilities are one thing, make it safe. It's also about the people, absolutely. I think. And I think you know, such a passion with all of the team here's fifty of us in total. Um, you know, the, the passion for for you know delivering excellent clinical trials, but most importantly, passion about the people we serve to do that you know our yeah. local population the wider northwest region uh etc uh that's where people get passionate and, and i think all of us believe that at our core and we do build very good relationships with our participants you know it's not always possible for participants to come back and do other studies but where it is we've seen participants come back again time and time again um you know which is where we've seen the feedback from the old unit to the new unit because they've been in multiple trials. So it just demonstrates that we do build those really good relationships with our community and our participants. Yeah, and I think that's reassuring, isn't it, for people that, you know, once they've done the experience, they realise, actually, this is good. You know, they're getting a lot from it. They're meeting other people as well, especially if somebody has a similar condition, perhaps, to them, if you're, you know, at that sort of stage of a trial. Or, you know, the... the Apart from the stuff that actually there is a lot of people do get real, you know, that they are putting something back into yeah. research is really important. So what I will do um, at, in this, um, you know, our podcast and in our uh, expert interview is put a link to your facility as well. And you can go and read on the website all about um, what we've actually just discussed, you know, what it's like. And you can sign up for trials. And so I know that you're specifically north, east, west. West. West, yeah, yeah. but I know sometimes you do have to recruit further afield and of course there's lots of other NIHR facilities as well and you know so this is you know for everybody within the NIHR hopefully we'll see what what's going on across the country so thank you both very much for your time it's really good to meet you both Richard and Kate thank you Brilliant. thanks very much lovely to meet you thank you, thank you.